please join me in the call to worship. God is present in the grandeur and power of creation. God is present in the many wonderful blessings of our lives. But it is enough for us that God comes through a gentle touch. God is present in the sounds of worship, the organ, the singing, the proclamation. But it is enough for us that God wraps us in the silence of grace. Come to worship with the expectation of God's presence. We watch and listen for God's presence in this holy hour on this holy ground. Good morning and welcome to worship here at Central Baptist Church. We are glad each of you are here, especially you fathers who have come to join us this morning. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers, grandfathers, and father figures out there. We are excited that each of you are here, and if you are visiting with us, we would love for you to fill out a visitor's card located in the pew rack in front of you and put it in the offering plate as it passes later in the service so that we can get to know you better as we continue to welcome you to Central. Each week, we gather. We gather to praise and worship God whose love and grace is found through the powerful and extraordinary and in the stillness and silence. Come, let us worship in the presence of God together. unfailing love upon us. Through each night we sing his songs, 
praying to the God who gives us life. Send out your light and your truth, O God. Let them guide us to your holy mountain, to the place where you live. Then we shall go to the altar of God, the source of all our joy. Slept in. Oh, even better. You can do it when you, when, when you get home. All right. How many of you have ever been somewhere where there were people talking and a lot of activity and, and there was so much noise, it was just so hard to concentrate? Have you ever been in that kind of situation? Just a lot of things going on. I've definitely been in those kind of situations. Um, recently, I was in Florence, Italy. And that was very hard to concentrate, especially trying to keep up with 16 people at the same time. That's how many people we had there. That's happened in the classroom when I was a teacher before. Had to shut that down real quick, like, right? Had, does that ever happen to y'all's classrooms? Everybody goes kind of crazy and the teacher's like, shh, no? Oh, well, <laughs> y'all's teachers are awesome then. <laughs> um, <laughs> so is it hard, if you're in that kind of situation, is that the kind of situation you would want to create if you were trying to concentrate on something really important? Like, say you were trying to take a test. Would you want lots of noise and crazy things going on? If you're in your classroom at school and your teacher says, come down here and listen to this story, and while I read this story to you, I want you to be as loud and as crazy as possible so that you can understand what I read to you. Does she say that to you? No. She wants you to be very quiet so that she can... Read the story, and you can hear what she's saying, or he, sorry, and then you know what, what the book is about, right? Have you ever heard somebody talking about listening to God? If you've been down here with me more than once, you've probably heard it, because I know we've talked about listening to God. And when people say that, do they really, are, are they really listening for God's voice? You, you, are you expecting God to like talk to you? Probably not. You might get a feeling or a thought, and we say that's the Holy Spirit, right, that God sent to us. So that's the Holy Spirit inside of us leading us through our thoughts and our feelings. People like to go and spend time with God or with the Holy Spirit by praying and by reading their Bibles and sometimes just being silent and saying they're listening for what God is trying to, to say to them. Um, that is what happens in our story today. Elijah is listening for God, but he ends up being in some situations where it was very hard to hear God. There was some powerful wind and an earthquake and a fire, and it was chaotic, and he just couldn't hear God in those situations. But when he finally got somewhere quiet, he could finally hear God speaking to him or um, and in, that, in those days, he might have actually heard God speaking. I feel like that might have been. But that was before the Holy Spirit. So now we feel the Holy Spirit. So next time you are in a quiet spot or if you're in a chaotic spot, maybe you go and find a quiet spot and you listen for God. Because sometimes if we never take those opportunities to have quiet time with God... We will never hear God speaking to us because 
our minds are too busy to understand what God's trying to say. So it's very important to have quiet time with God. Do you all already do that? No? Maybe? Oh, your prayers at night? That's a perfect time. I like that. I have a hard time doing that, to, to be still and listen. So I have to really concentrate on doing that, too, because our lives are very busy. So it takes a lot to stop and listen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for sending your spirit to tell us what you want us to do. Help us to set aside time in our lives to listen for you and all the things you want us to know. Amen. A reading from the Psalms, Psalm 22, verses 19 through 28. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life, from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him, revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him, for dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Please join me in the prayers of the people and the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. As we gather here together in these silent moments of prayer, we come to you with our lives, our hearts, our minds, and our souls full of so much, God, and in need of so much more. You know our needs, and you know our fullness. You know that which in our lives threatens to overwhelm us that which is perhaps too much for us, and that which maybe even causes us to run. God, in these silent moments, we pray that you will speak to us the words we need to hear so that we can stop running and find rest in you. Speak to us words of healing for the pain, grief, and illness that we and our loved ones experience. Speak to us words of peace for the conflict, violence, and war in our communities, nation, and world. Speak to us words of forgiveness for the sins we have committed against ourselves, one another, creation, and you. Speak to us words of love so that we may remember each person and part of creation is deeply loved by you and bears your precious image. Speak to us words of celebration that we may rejoice and hope in the Holy Spirit's transforming power to give justice, righteousness, and freedom unto all your good creation. Speak to us, God, so that our lives may speak testimonies unto your steadfast and abiding love. And now, let us join our voices together as one, speaking together the words Jesus Christ taught the disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. us when we are afraid and when we are zealous for you, when we are strong and when we think we have had enough. No matter where we are, you give us the strength needed for our journey and for that we thank you. Let us demonstrate that thanks through our giving so that we strengthen your church on its journey of serving. In Jesus' name I pray.
Knoxville, Tennessee, a friend of mine there had an uncle who owned a hardware store in town, the kind of hardware store that existed in towns all over the United States before Lowe's and Home Depot came into town. You walked in there and it immediately smelled like work 
like oil and grease and lumber and paint thinner all mixed together. Just being in there for a few minutes. You didn't even have to touch anything. Just being in there for a few minutes. You walk out and your hands would be covered in that grime, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about. It's that kind of place. Once a year, they took inventory there, a physical hand count of everything they owned. The last week in July and the first week in August, every year it was their slowest time of year when everybody else was on vacation getting ready for the school year to start again. So for two years while I was in Knoxville, two summers, this uncle would invite his niece Ashley and all of her friends to come work at the hardware store to help out with the inventory count each summer. We had clipboards and pencils and inventory lists with manufacturer numbers on them and we spread out across the store and down the aisles and back into the storerooms we all went. Eight compressors, check. 25 gallons of this kind of paint, 15 gallons of this other kind of paint over here, 14 shovels, 25 broom handles, and then you had to start counting the hardware, 974 screws. 1,273 washers. Oh, I've lost count. Do I need to start over again? How important is it that we get this right down to the exact number of washers? For weeks leading up to the annual count, the regular employees of the store would tell us we would do everything possible not to open those thousand count bags of small, loose hardware. A closed bag was just a thousand. An open bag you had to count. Don't open those bags, they would say. Ever since that experience, hardly a summer has gone by when I haven't thought of summer as a good time of year to take stock, to take inventory, a good time to get a physical count of who we are and where we're going and what we have. Every once in a while, you do have to pause and just take inventory. We read from Psalm 22 this morning. It's is the psalm that begins, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The psalm that Jesus quotes from the cross when he's feeling abandoned and alone. It sits in our Bible, Psalm 22 does, right next to Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. God leads me, God guides me, God walks with me. He restores my soul, my, my cup overflows. I, I looked up in my Bible, they really are on facing pages in mine. One page, Psalm 22, one page... Psalm 23, two different extremes of our experience with God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? One psalm begins, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. My cup overflows, the next psalm says. I wonder where you find yourself this morning on that spiritual spectrum between forsakenness and overflowing cups. Where are we as we sit here this morning and pause to take inventory? Our biblical example this morning is the prophet Elijah. Ahab and Jezebel are the king and queen of the northern kingdom of Israel, and they're evil people, Ahab and Jezebel are. They don't do what God wants them to do at all as leaders. Jezebel is the daughter of the king of Tyre, we're told. She's not even a Jew. It's like, by the way, when you hear that somebody you know, you discover that somebody you know went to school at Auburn, you immediately think, well, they're a little bit suspect, right? <laughs> when you hear in the Bible that somebody is from Tyre, you should have immediately the same kind of reaction. They're a little bit suspect. No offense, Mrs. Tyre. This is, this is just a truth universally acknowledged in Scripture, right? <laughs> In the Bible, when you hear that someone is from Tyre, it ought to raise your eyebrows just a little bit. Jezebel, when Ahab married her, immediately cut off all of the Lord's prophets from the king's court. She kicked them out, Elijah included. She didn't want to see them. She didn't want to hear them. She didn't value their advice. She didn't want their influence. Instead, she preferred the prophets of Baal, the prophets from the faith of her home country, I told you it's not a good thing to be from Tyre. In fact, the Bible says that when Ahab married Jezebel, he did more to arouse the anger of God in uniting with her than had all of the kings of Israel who came before him combined. Eventually, all of the prophets of the Lord 
had either been scattered or killed or driven into hiding, all save Elijah, only he was left. And Elijah sets up a great showdown with Jezebel. Lonely old Elijah, the last remaining faithful prophet, lines himself up against 450 prophets of Baal. A grand challenge. They each have their own altars set up. They each have their own bowls arranged for sacrifice. And Elijah stands in front of one altar and 450 prophets parade around the other altar. And they're each trying to call down fire from God. Whoever does it first wins. Ultimately, they're trying to see which God, whose God can save Israel from drought and famine. All of Israel gathers to see the great showdown. They're all there, the whole nation. And Elijah succeeds in spectacular fashion. It's a career-defining victory for Elijah. Just a high point in all of Scripture of what one man's Faithful actions can lead to. But Jezebel is so angry that she sends after Elijah to have him killed. So Elijah, from one sentence in scripture to the next, literally goes from the very highest of highs that one person can experience there in success on Mount Carmel and descends to the lowest of lows, literally running for his life, fleeing Israel, seeking to run beyond the limits of Jezebel's power to preserve his life. And eventually he is alone and he's exhausted and he's depressed and he's hungry. And he doesn't know where he's going to find his next meal. He doesn't know what to do or where to go or who to turn to. And in his desperation, feeling abandoned, way, way out on the, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me end of the spectrum? He sits down under a broom tree, under a shade tree to shield himself from the heat of the sun and lays down to die. And in that moment, in the depths of his despair, alone and off by himself, God came to him and touched him. The angel of the Lord, it says, reached out and touched him, strengthened him. Strengthened by the presence of the Lord who fed him one day after the other, Elijah then traveled for 40 days and 40 nights alone, taking stock taking inventory, trying to figure out what was next. And at the end of those 40 days, God spoke to Elijah and said, Elijah, what are you doing? And Elijah basically looks at God and says, I'm still not sure. He says, I, I know where I've been. That's what he tells God. But I have no idea where I'm God said, go stand out on the edge of this mountain. Elijah went out and stood at the edge of the mountain, and he watched a storm go by. Wind and earthquake and fire, Scripture says. I just picture a huge, huge thunderstorm. Rain blowing sideways, wind so loud you have to shout over it to be heard. Thunder that shakes the ground underneath your feet. Lightning that lights up the entire sky. And when the storm had passed, the sound of silence. And in the silence, Elijah heard God again. What are you doing, Elijah? But this time, Elijah had an answer. He knew where he was going next. Pastor Joel Gregory says there are three enemies to the spiritual life. Noise, crowds, and hurry. Three enemies to the spiritual life. Noise, crowds, and hurry. Sometimes it's good to get away. To be off all alone and by yourself. Only you, Dr. Gregory says, may know the intimate thing that God has done to you or for you or in you. Sometimes, he says, God needs to do something so intimate for you, that only you and he will know it. 
There are things in your life that need the touch of God to figure out. Sometimes God needs to get you alone to do it. I can tell you this, Dr. Gregory continues, I can testify that the Lord Jesus Christ has taken me aside and done things in my life that were only for me and only for me to know. I can say the same thing. Many of you can, too. Something like that happens to Elijah in Scripture. When Elijah got away from the noise and the hurry and the crowds, God did something for him that was only for him and only for him to know. Author Megan Steelstra talks about dealing with postpartum depression. Talk about moving from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows. Postpartum depression is that experience from my cup overflows, right, to my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 15% of mothers experience postpartum depression in a clinical kind of way. All mothers know the fear and the doubt and the loneliness and the fragility of those first few weeks and months at home with a newborn child. Megan describes friends coming over in the depths of her first few months at home with her new son. They'd come over to hold the baby for her so that she could maybe have time to just take a shower. She says, they'd come over and hold the baby and I would go into the bathroom and I'd close the door and I'd turn the shower on and let the water run so they'd think I was taking a shower, but I'd just lie down on the cold tile floor and cry, she says. She thought she was fooling her friends until about the third time one of her friends came over to sit with her like that. Her girlfriend said, Megan, this time you have to actually take a shower. (laughs) She said, I walked into the bathroom. I didn't even have the energy or the will to even take off my grungy, dirty clothes. I just stepped into the shower and turned the water on in my yoga pants and my sweatshirt. and I just let it run all over. So I walked out of the bathroom dripping wet, weighed down by the weight of my wet clothes, leaving a puddle behind me as I walked out of the bathroom and across the living room to the bedroom to dry off. Four years later, she remembers, on a Sunday morning in Chicago where where her family lives, on the shore of Lake Michigan, church, Black, white, and brown faces, teenagers, middle-aged, senior adults, people of all kinds, she said, a church had gathered to hold a baptism at the lake. She said, we were in their way with our dog playing out in the water, playing fetch, our now four-year-old son out there too. She said, but it was almost too late to move by the time we realized just exactly how in the way we were. So we just stood closely beside them and watched. I on the shore, my son now four, about knee deep in Lake Michigan. We watched. One by one, they walked out of the water, weighed down by the weight of their wet clothes, dripping wet, leaving puddles in the sand as they went to dry off. She said, what I remember about that experience was the silence. Pastor nodding to me as he acknowledged us as part of our group and waving to my son. But us being just far enough away that it was too far for us to speak. Watching the pastor whispering to the others in the water as he dunked them underneath one by one. Whispering words too soft for me to hear. The sound of silence. Maybe I was saved too, she says, thinking back on that experience. Maybe we all were. Three years later, still in Chicago, still living in the same condo in town, she walked into the pediatrician's office where she had gone when her son was born. The same receptionist still worked there and She stood in front of that receptionist as that receptionist sat at her desk behind the counter as she walked into the office. 
She says, I said in one long, breathless, run-on sentence as I tried not to cry. I'm not sure if you'll remember, but seven years ago I had severe postpartum depression. And one day at an appointment I started crying in the lobby with my son and the baby carrier. And you walked over to me and said, you are not alone. What's happening to you is normal. And that seemingly small gesture was a life raft in ways I'm only just now understanding. And I want you to know how grateful I am. And I hope I'm not freaking you out by being here and saying this to you right now. And also, you're an angel. <laughs> she says the receptionist reached out and put her hand on my hand and nodded to the waiting area behind me. And there sat a woman with an infant car seat at her feet, eyes red, mascara smeared, crying. I turned around and looked back behind the desk at the receptionist again, and our eyes locked. Neither one of us said a word. The sound of silence. Sometimes God needs to do something for you so intimate that you, only you and God, will know what God is doing. What are you doing, God asks. We don't know, we say. On the other side of silence, God just might provide an answer. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we experience all kinds of great swings in life. High highs and low lows. Living most of our lives settled somewhere in between. Somewhere between Psalm 22 and Psalm 23. Remind us that it's good to get away. Find quiet moments with you to take stock, to take inventory, to ask, what are we doing here? Who are we? Where are we headed? In the stillness of our time with you, we pray you'll give us answers. In Jesus' name, amen. We end every service at Central by giving you an opportunity to respond to what God may be doing in your life or in your heart. If there's a way you would respond publicly, I would invite you to meet me at the front of our sanctuary as we sing our departing hymn together. Stand with me, please, as we sing it. Katie's comments from the beginning of worship. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers in the room. And make one announcement before we leave today. Vacation Bible School is coming up quick. If you need to register someone for Vacation Bible School and want to make sure that they have a t-shirt, we need you to register by June 24th. That's this week. So go home, get online, check out our website, click the link in your challenge. You can register that way. Make sure you register this week so that we can order a t-shirt, t-shirts for you and your family members who are attending. And whether you want a t-shirt or not, we need everybody to be registered for Vacation Bible School by July 1st. So tell everybody you know, 
register by July 1st uh, so that we can be best prepared for all of our kids as they come to join us for Vacation Bible School before we go into that holiday weekend or holiday week that leads in to Vacation Bible School. I'll thank all of you for being present in worship today. As I remind you almost every week, I hope all of us leave this hour of worship encouraged and emboldened to be faithful representatives both of our church and of our Lord Jesus Christ. Have a wonderful week. Bow with me now for our benediction. Part now in peace and as you go, may the God who makes all things holy and whole make you holy and whole, puts you together spirit, soul, and body, and keep you fit for the coming of our Master, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. <laughs>